interesting. I get so many calls. Why did Juan join? What made him join? So we figured, we, we put it on Beaker TV here and we ask him directly, why did he join? Well, that's a, a great question. <laughs> it's great to be here, actually. So as you know, I was an advisor for almost two years before yeah. joining. To the day. Yeah, As to the day, yeah, absolutely. So I'm an endocrinologist. I've been practicing doing clinical trials for almost 30 years. Yeah. And over that time, I've seen an unbelievable evolution in therapies for diabetes. I mean, when I finished medical school in 89, all we had were sulfonylureas and insulin. So we had two medications that both of them increase body weight, both of them can cause hypoglycemia, and certainly the sulfonylureas end up causing further decline in beta cell function. Wow. And it wasn't until 95 that we even had metformin to add. Mm. But over the last 20 years, you know, we've ended up with 10 classes of drugs, all kinds of combinations, and, and therapy really has changed. But still patients, a lot of patients, up to 50% aren't achieving targets. And one of the reasons for this is that we've never been able to address the root cause of type 2 diabetes, which is a decline in beta cell function. Yeah. So the cells that produce and secrete insulin. Yeah. So I thought, you know, with with what we have here at Biomia, this is really addresses that root cause and um, found it incredibly interesting as an endocrinologist, as a scientist as well. And um, you know, very happy to have made this transition to help this get to the finish line and be available for patients. With your background, when I st studied your background, it, you are really needed in this process because we developed a drug it's born out of chemistry and it's born out of biology, right? Right, right. And we found a way to match the two in a way that this now gives the benefit. But now getting it through the clinic, bringing it through academia recognition, right, right. and then getting all the, the, the partners to agree that this is useful and beneficial in the FDA, et cetera, and doing it right. That's where you come in. Can you please describe a little bit of your background in the clinical operations field? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So my fellowship, this was almost 30 years ago, was a research fellowship. So clinical research yeah. fellowship. I, I was studying doing what are called glucose clamps, looking at insulin resistance, also looking at insulin secretion as well and different drugs and, and um, not only sort of quote unquote defects in patients, but how these drugs may address them. Um, so I've always been interested in clinical research. I actually went from academia and was in industry for a number of years. So I worked in drug development on, on this side, on the industry side, in mostly in big pharma. So Eli Lilly, for example, at Pfizer, or Johnson & Johnson, but also in, in more startup situations, which was Amyl and pharmaceuticals, and then went back into clinical practice. So my, my most recent position has been actually as a clinician and clinical researcher. Yeah. So running clinical research centers in Los Angeles where we actually conduct the research for the so-called sponsors of the pharmaceutical or biotech companies. And with that, you know, in many of these studies, I've been what's the so-called coordinated investigator, so sort of the global principal investigator. So I've also had a chance to sign the clinical study reports, you know, even go back to actually helping write the protocols, right. conducting the studies, um, reviewing the data, being very involved in publications, um, presentations, data dissemination, which has been a lot of fun for me. So not only yeah. you know rolling your sleeves up and conducting the research, yeah. but being very involved in the full development. And I'll give you a, a good example, and this has happened over the years with, with a couple of really important medications, I think. For example, terzepatide, which was recently launched by Eli Lilly as Manjaro being mm -hmm. the trade name. We started with the phase two trials. This was you know, eight, nine years ago. And I saw that from the first phase two study, which we published in 2018 in The Lancet, all the way through the five registration trials, the so-called surpass trials, to the point where then I was able to prescribe it to patients. So Whoa. I had the reps coming in, yeah. we had samples. So I've, I've seen it from, from sort of beginning, not, yeah. not in animals really, right. but starting with human trials. Yeah from beginning to end and you know, a, a very interesting program. 
a very important medication as yeah. well. And I think that's something the world will do here as well. And that's been very rewarding over the years with, with this drug and, and others. Very cool. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. How many publications do you have to your name? Um, over 150. I mean, I've got thousands of abstracts that have been presented over the years, yeah. but peer reviewed publications, um, you know, well over 100. And, and I think in very good journals, I've been very fortunate with that, with first author publications in the Journal, Journal, like Lancet, Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, Diabetes Care. So, um, and, I, and I think they've been very, you know, I'm a clinician at heart, very clinically relevant papers, you know, looking at higher doses of semaglutide or ozempic, higher doses of dulaglutide or trulicity, mm -hmm. Manjaro or Terzepatide versus semaglutide or ozempic. So I think there have been publications that really have, have gone into guidelines, for example, mm -hmm. that have really helped clinical practice, which has been important to me too. And how many phase threes have you been involved in? Oof. Hundreds, I would say, yeah. A lot of clinical development programs. Okay. You know, phase three, phase three B, yeah. some phase four, but most most of my clinical trial work has been late phase one, yeah. phase two studies. For example, we recently published the you know, combination of tigrilantide with semaglutide of a um, called Cagri Sema. And we had that published in, in the Lancet. That was a very important phase two study, and based yeah. on that now. That molecule or those molecules in combination have moved into phase three for both obesity and type two diabetes, but a lot of phase three trials over the years. And how many approvals have you been involved in? I couldn't tell you exactly, but twenty ish for twenty plus, 20 plus plus I would say in some form or another. And many drugs I think that that you know been involved with recently that I think will gain yeah. approval over time or, or at least gain new indications. I mean, certainly terzepatide yeah. for obesity, for example, but there are, there are other examples with SGLT2 inhibitors, you know, for, for renal disease now and heart failure as well. If I look at all these drugs that you mentioned, mm -hmm. all the trials you've mentioned, have you seen one that addressed the pathophysiology of the disease? No, I have not. <laughs> and that's, and that's and you know, at the end of the day, that's what, what we started with. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons I'm here, because yeah. I, I think there is an important unmet need. And I would say not only to, to address this key defect, yeah. as you look at you know, all of the issues, if you will, that result in hyperglycemia and type two diabetes, at the core of it is the reduction in beta cell function and this progressive yeah. decline. And it, you could be very insulin resistant, but if you're producing and secreting enough insulin, you can maintain normal glycemia. Yeah. So it's not really until the beta cell starts failing and function starts declining yeah. that then you get prediabetes, type two diabetes. So really none, this, this you know, the, the BMF 219 really gets to the core issue of type two diabetes. And I think it'll be combinational therapy. I mean, it doesn't negate the use of other medications which are important mm -hmm. For glycemic control, but for weight control, mm -hmm. for cardio cardiorenal risk reduction as well, potentially for the liver. Yeah. So we'll be learning more about this molecule combining with other drugs as well. But um, but the answer to your question is none, and that I think is what, what really gets me totally excited. Sad. And the fact I'm going to yeah. go on the <laughs> fact that it can be, and we'll see. You know, the yeah. studies to date that have very nice data show four weeks of therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll be will be assessing the longer, longer therapy, but it is finite therapy. And one of the key issues with why many patients with type 2 diabetes can't achieve target is also issues with adherence, persistence, polypharmacy, and just the burden mm -hmm. of therapy. So I think here we have an oral agent. We have an agent that can be given for a specific period of time and continues to work. We'll need to work out exactly what these regimens look like, but I think that's critically important as well. Super. Thank you very much. My pleasure.